Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Psyched to be with you. I am quite literally psyched. I'm very excited. It is a pleasure and a privilege as always to be with you. Uh, this episode we've got another very very special guest. Uh, someone I'm proud to say is a colleague as well. Uh, I'll pass it over to you in a second. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to my very special guest. Please tell us who you are, what you do and what you do when you're not doing that. Hi, my name's uh, Daniel Wolf. Um so as you said, I'm a colleague as of yours. Um, so I'm a GTA um, in the psychology department at Edgeley University. Um, so my PhD at the moment is on um, concussion and how that affects uh, three broad outcomes. So I'm interested in how uh, predominantly sport-related concussion can impact on mental health, um, cognition, and then how that can impact our quality of life afterwards. Um, I'm forgetting what the question was now, Chris. What else was there? Uh, what do you do when you're not doing that? What do I do when I'm not doing that? Um, so I'm quite quite keen on exercise. So I do quite a lot of running. Um, go, to, go to the gym quite a lot. Um, I quite like hiking. So um, anywhere sort of, you know, out, out in, in the great outdoors, as it were. Um, so I've done Snowden once. Um, quite, I was planning on doing um, Scarfell Pike. Um, I think, was it? about April of last year, but obviously um, with restrictions, we weren't able, weren't able to in the end. So um, we are planning that soon um, and then hopefully be nervous at some point as well in the near future. So going for the uh, some of the big the big peaks? Yeah, some of the, the, the biggest peaks, yeah, yeah. I've, yeah well, I've also done the Yorkshire Three Peaks, um, not, in, not in one day as a lot of people do actually, but um, I've done them you know, separately, um, which were quite good as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, it's always there's always a bit of a sense of achievement once you once you've done anything like that. I don't know if you've done anything like that before. Uh, I haven't done any like big sort of like proper hikes or anything, but you know, I, I enjoy a good walk. I've, I've you know ran, ran races. I'm quite. Sp- I'm good. Yeah. I don't want to say sporty because I'm not as sporty as you, but I you know <laughs> try and look after myself. Um, I have yeah, to admit. Think... Oh, go on. No, I was just going to say I think everyone's uh, definitely going to walk in over the last year or so. Yeah, well, you're one of the few things you could do. Um, yeah. So I was going to say, I think, you know, we've, we've spoken before, obviously, with colleagues um, about your research area is generally really quite interesting. Obviously, it links to mental health, which, you know, if you've been with us before on the show, you know, we're very keen on. Um, but generally, can we, let's just talk a bit more about, like, your know, you're midway through your PhD, you're on your final year, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So two, two years of the... Th- Hopefully three now, yeah. Um, so just on my third year. So, um, yeah. So, what, what was it you was asking? Just <laughs> well, I was just saying. So, you, yeah, you're in your third year. Um, tell yeah, us yeah. about sort of like your research journey and sort of like you know concussion mental health. That's quite a broad spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, back going back to undergrad, really. That's where it all started. My interest um, was predominantly back then was on that mental health, like you say. So, um, I think more in the media at that time so this was probably about five years ago now and it just kept coming out um, in the media with different um sort of elite athletes that are struggling with the mental health and stuff like that usually after retirement so quite a lot of footballers that were reportedly um sort of having depressive episodes and stuff like that so um i was quite interested in that just because i was interested in sort of um depression anyway just like so sort of, what is it what you know how, how can we get it how can we alleviate these symptoms stuff like that um so i was quite interested just in general about mental health um but then i was also interested in how these sort of elite athletes you know they've got they're very well paid you know they've got a lot a lot um, of positiveness positive energy in their life um but um yeah so i was really interested in how though these these types of people can can sort of suffer from um depression so um, obviously, as an undergrad, um, I weren't able. Well, I didn't have much access to like elite, elite level players. So um, it did go on to a sort of student athlete. Um, and as I was going through sort of like the literature, you know, sort of um, sort of developing my ideas and stuff, one of the things that kept cropping up was um, concussion um, and how this could um, sort of exacerbate depressive symptoms. Um, so that's really where. The concussion sort of journey, as you as you coined it, came from, um, and then that followed into my masters, um, carried on with that there, 
And uh, yeah, and then pretty much that is how I've got onto these three broad outcomes, which obviously tail off into different directions um, of how concussion can impact those three big, big bigger outcomes. So what, um, what out of interest, what did you actually study? What were your undergraduate and master's degrees in? Because obviously there's a big, you're again, big spectrum of like sports psychology and biological psychology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, my undergrad degree was at Ed Chill as well. Um, that was sport and exercise psychology. So um, that kind of, well, sort of pushed me in that direction as well because by the time you got to your third year, you, you, it was a requirement to do a um, dissertation in sport and exercise psychology. So um, yeah, doing doing something, I kind of mixed them together a little bit in terms of, um, it was probably a, a bit more straight psych than some of the others in terms of I used a, a sporting sample, but um, whereas like some of my other like friends at the time were doing it, you know, a lot more sports psych, sort of like performance sort of based stuff. Um, so yeah, so I did that. And then, um, yeah, funnily enough, I, I did kind of, kind of, because of that, I did kind of drift I tried to anyway, I tried to pull myself away from the sports side. Um, and I did a master's, I did an MRes in Bath just in straight psychology. Um, and then again, just because my research interests, I just got sort of sucked into that. So still into, you know, concussion in sport and um and what what that could lead to. Um and then yeah, obviously we, we, I did decide during my dissertation in my first under, in an undergrad degree. Um, that I enjoyed that that much that I did want to become a lecturer. I did want a career in academia, um, just because I thought, well, um, I really enjoy this, and I really enjoy you know uh, the research aspect, and I would like to make a career on that. Um, and I've since realised that I, I do actually quite enjoy teaching as well, um, as I've been uh, doing in my GTA role. So, um, yeah. So during my masters, obviously, like I, that was when I got into applying for. Um, this GTA role, and luckily, I, I got it. <laughs> I did a, must have done a good proposal and a good interview. So, um, and that has led on to like the last couple of years that I've been researching this now. Okay, so that I mean that's great. We've got a really good sort of picture of like where you started from and where you've sort of got to. So, you you're heading into year three. Where are you up to now? Like, what's currently going on? Um. So so far, I think I've written up three papers now um out of what i've been doing in from, from the data collection so but listeners um, benefit that's pretty that's pretty good just pointing that out <laughs> i hope so anyway <laughs> um yeah they, they are they're all under review as well at the moment so hopefully uh, some positive news back soon um but yeah so um essentially what i found at the moment is that um with what surprisingly in the literature in, in concussion because it is quite it is still quite new, despite um, the higher amount of sort of coverage it's getting at the moment. Um, the research on concussion, even ten years ago, it seemed to be like more of an, an add-on to what a different what a different study was looking at. Um, so, as I say, in terms of like, if someone was investigating depressive symptoms in athletes. It was always kind of a have you had concussion or not. That was just like an add on at the end. Um, so, what what because of that, what a lot of papers haven't accounted for is pain, physical pain, um, which is unsurprisingly accompanies concussion quite a lot, um, and just athletes in general, even without concussion. So, um, what I've been looking at, at at like during my PhD is how this you know, relationship between um, concussion and pain um, coincides and sort of how they both relate to um, the three broad outcomes that I've mentioned, really. Um, so, yeah, so the couple of papers that I've found at the moment is um, that pain might actually be um, a bigger indicator of uh, the the mental health outcomes. So, um yeah, the, the physical pain is pretty much what could lead to higher depressive symptoms and higher state anxiety symptoms um, and actually poorer quality of life, whereas it might be the concussion itself that actually leads to poorer cognition, so um, poorer working memory, poorer cognitive flexibility, things like that, whereas the pre previous literature 
um, you suggested that concussion leads to all three. So what I'm posing is that pain actually might be a bigger predictor of poorer mental health, whereas concussion is what causes uh, the poorer cognition, impaired cognition. Okay, I mean, that's, again, like, that's really uh, interesting and, like, needed work. I, you know, I know you, you touched on it yourself. There's been a little bit of coverage around this. My only knowledge of it, like, personally is from, believe it or not, under the podcast episode that was looking at um, concussion in NFL players and, like, the detrimental yeah. effect that it had on them, like, you know, particularly around even some very serious mental health conditions and physical damage to the brain and stuff. Um, so it's definitely a under-researched area, you know, clearly because you're doing it as a PhD. Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, yeah. I hate to ask, I know it's a dirty question when you're studying your PhD, but what what do you want to do next afterwards? Yeah, so um, what, in terms of research? Cause and, and like where, where do you want to go with, with the PhD? Um, yeah, so at the moment, like, because I'm finding um, so, like, quite good find good but quite um i would say good quite good findings with um pain um significant findings with pain well um, just so again for listeners benefit there you know significant is a scientific word and that means a thing with yeah. measurements and good and yeah. meaningful maybe <laughs> is a good one meaningful yeah meaningful meaningful is a good word to use actually yeah so because we're finding more, more meaningful um results with um pain um the issue that I've had is that is is the measurements that we're using for pain. So, um, where are there quite well validated um, measures for like depression and anxiety and stuff like that? Um, with pain, that there, there are quite. Um, so the one I'm using, for example, is called the NRS, and that's um, just a simple zero to ten um, scale of how much pain you um, experienced in the past week. Um, so that has its drawbacks. Um, so, as I say, because because pain seems to be rearing its head during my research, I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe should be um, attempting to develop a, a more rigorous um, pain scale. So that's what I'm doing at the moment, um, and hopefully, I think that is what I could be doing um, in the years to come. Um, so, one of the things I'm trying to sort of one of the gaps I'm trying to bridge is that. Um, to the different time points in which pain can be experienced. So, um, as I say, the one that I've been using at the minute is, is experienced in the past week, which is important, but what tends to happen is people will then give an average. So, if, for example, today, if I was to ask you, on Saturday, you might have been in like a 10, and today you're in none, and then you might put a five. And then it's not really grasping the true pain that you're in. And it's not, it's certainly not grasping the pain that you're in now. So um what I'm what I'm posing to do is do two different time points, um, whereby you do what you're in right now, what pain you've got experiencing right now, and what you've done in the last week. So then you might put zero now and you might put, you know, nine or ten in the past week. And then that 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 way we might be able to um measure pain a little bit better. Um and the other thing I'm trying to do as well is um identify the area of pain so I've sort of divided um the scale into different areas of the body um in that case it would reveal sort of which areas of bodily pain or headache or whatever um might predict poorer mental health or quality of life or cognition for example i think that location one's really important because i mean you know like i've got like say like a really busted knee like sometimes I may just be, maybe just get aggravation from that, but that can be completely dwarfed by the pain I feel from my existential dread. You know, two very different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean I've not included that one, but um, yeah, I know where you're going with it. Um, so yeah, so hopefully, um, I think there's that's definitely got legs. Like I think um, it, it's definitely something that'll be included in um, the PhD project and the thesis at the moment, but. I also think it could be something that um, I could be doing for like a few years um, to go, yeah. You kind of mentioned before you you found that you've enjoyed the teaching element of your role, so you, you're researching, you're teaching. Um, do you see yourself continuing that, or do you sort of see yourself more going into the hard research kind of stuff? Um, no, I do hope so, yeah. I think um, for me, 
I was I'd never had any teaching experience beforehand and I was quite uh, nervous. I think a lot I think most people are, especially GTA. Um and then but, but yeah, I think when I did start, um and remember when I did start, this was in person, this was um January 2020, so when I started teaching that is. Um so for about eight weeks it was in person in a pre pre COVID world. Um so I, yeah, and I really did enjoy it. So you know, more so than I thought. And I think what what's what I still remember now is that um sort of other GTAs like um around me sort of you used to think it you would refer to it as like a burden, like so oh, I you know, I've got teaching today, I'm doing this and that. And they'd really like, you know, be wanting to do the research. But um for me, it's always been like quite a nice I wouldn't like to say rest, but I think it's more, it, 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 it compartmentalizes what you're doing a bit better, I think, in terms of like, I think for me, if you get too sort of bogged down in research all the time, um, it, you could be less productive for it, I think. Um, whereas when, when you're teaching, it's kind of like, well, it's this, I'm doing this now, this is a nice break, or you get to you, you socialize, like you get to chat with all the students, got some good ideas. Um, and then once you've done that, you say, like, okay, put that away now, and then back to the back to the research. So I'm hoping to, yeah, I hope obviously going into lecturing and stuff, I can carry on with obviously lectures, but hopefully seminars as well. Okay, well, that's pretty good. I mean, it's, as I say, yeah, if you're pardon the pun, it sounds like you've got your head screwed on. You know, <laughs> you, you kind of know what you want to do and where you're going with it, and the research sounds really interesting. Um, so what do you like to get up to when you aren't working? You know, what have you been getting up to lately? Um, at the moment, I've just been spending a lot of time with family and friends, to be honest. I think most people have been as well, like, obviously, um, with what's going on and all what's going on and still going on. Um, with the restrictions being lifted and stuff, just been definitely trying to make up for lost time and stuff. Um, I like to travel, so I've been um, been to Edinburgh last weekend or the weekend before with my partner. Um, where else have we been? We've been to Cornwall over summer as well. Um, we go in London as well this next weekend, or this weekend, next weekend. Um, so yeah, I quite like traveling and um, definitely prefer traveling abroad as well. But I think, interestingly enough, I've kind of appreciated our own country a bit more. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've done any traveling around, around here, but um, yeah, definitely like the lakes and Peak District. And um, as I say, Edinburgh had never been before. Um, I'm not a massive fan of London, but. Um, I'll always visit. I, I, I wouldn't like to live there, but <laughs> I'll visit. But yeah, I'd never been Cornwall either. So um, in memory, anyway, um, and that was that was brilliant. That was the, that was that week that we had like a heat wave, so we couldn't have timed it better, really. Oh, I mean, that um, was that was not a fun week for me personally. But <laughs> was it not? No, no uh, a bit, bit too hot for me. Uh, so you you went to oh, of course. Uh, you went to Edinburgh <laughs> for the first time. Place. Um, how what did you think of that? I went for the first time last year as well. I I really enjoyed it. What did you get up to? Yeah, I, I thought it was amazing. Yeah, um, and I can't remember why we said we went. I think we there wasn't even a reason we went. I think it was just a, just a long weekend away. Um, but yeah, it was. I, I really liked the history. Really. I thought it was really good. Um, I went. We went to. Um, we did two like ghost kind of walks. Um, one of them, one of them wasn't like a. Neither of them were ghost walks, really. In hindsight, they were both called ghost walks. But the first one was kind of like a spooky tales walk, um, where we sort of went around the city and they were telling us all like the history and stuff um, about Birkenhead and stuff like that. Um, and then another one was where you went down into the vaults. I don't know if you did that. Did you do that? No, no, not personally. No. Um, so that was quite interesting as well, and. I'm not one as how do I say as a scientist. I've got quite a rational mind. I think and I'm not one for like ghosts and spirits and stuff like that. But when I was down there, and he was telling me to basically stand in a circle of stones. Um, I didn't do it. I was too nervous to actually do it. <laughs> um, and now thinking back, it, it was surely it's just a circle of stones. But the the story had attached to it. I was just I thought no, I'm not risking that. No chance. Um, what else did we do? Went to uh, Lot Lomond, which was beautiful. I thought that was really nice. It's nearby, isn't it? Um, Stirling Castle. Um, so that was a really good trip as well. So, um, 
Yeah, but yeah, what what I would say is like Edinburgh just thought was it was it was small, but to, to say it was you know a capital city, like I thought it was quite a small city. Um, but yeah, I just I fell in love with the history of it. Really, like I really like I really liked learning about you know so sort of what's gone on in the last sort of hundreds of years, basically. I would like to clarify this episode is not sponsored by Visit Scotland. However, I would also like to add that <laughs> Edinburgh was very good and very fun. It was, yeah. Did, did you did you find the history interesting as well? Or? Yeah, we we um I went with my partner as well. We hit up a few museums. We went to the uh, med medical history museum. That was really interesting. Mm. Uh, we actually went uh, on a tour from there. It's like like you say, it was a, a spooky, but not necessarily like a yeah. true ghost tour, if you will. Um. It was just a very nice place to be. Uh, as you say, it is it is quite, I'm going to say small, but that means you can sort of get around everywhere quite easily. Yeah. Um. You know, uh, what else? Uh, we went to a place called, and again, this is not an ad, but if you ever find yourself in Edinburgh, Camera Obscura, um, like a house. Oh, like we didn't illusions. go. The illusion, yeah, yeah. We well, oh, were thinking of doing that. We never got um, around to it. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I'm well, blind, really so imagine imagine how much more fun you'd have <laughs> if you could see. Um, it was whereabouts know, was it? Do you remember? I honestly can't remember. I remember, yo, it was on a hill, but that's not very descriptive for Edinburgh. Yeah, no, <laughs> not very, no. Be around all all day looking for the hill. <laughs> well, we did do that actually. Went to um, what's it called? The, the hill. The um, basically overlooks overlooks the city. We oh, there, the um, the the seat. Is it, is it... No, 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 no. That's a different one. Um, no, it wasn't that big. No. no. <laughs> Arthur's seat is that other one, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this one was just um, was, yeah, it was just kind of just a bit out of the city. Um, but basically, the guy, the guide from on the Saturday, um, he he basically said that's where you get the the postcard picture. Basically, so we walked up, and sure enough, it was really nice. <laughs> so yeah, that was good as well. Good stuff. Well, I mean, I think you know you are right. You kind of have to make the most of these opportunities while you can, and you know responsibly. But um, particularly when, because I think it's it's something that I found with doing the PhD, and I, you know, I always like to remind people at this point I'm doing you know, my first year. But you kind of you never have you're never not expected to be working on something, right? Like unless you are mm -hmm. maybe sort of taking a day off. And I know a lot of people see education like, oh, you get the summer off. There's no one to teach. Uh, it's not yeah. quite like that, so you really kind of have to make the most of these moments. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that just summed it up. There's, there are so many people that still think that, um, well, one, a student in terms of, you know, which is technically true, but seeing me as a student as, oh, well, he just has the summer off and then he goes back. No, that's not the case. And two, um, oh, he's a teacher, so he has the summer off. And again, like, it's not the case, so... Yeah, something I'm a student, something I'm a teacher. Um, but what definitely is is the case is that I don't have the summer off. How how do you kind um, of find managing both like roles? Because they they're not quite juxtaposed, but they're very different. Yeah, yeah. I think um, what is good in our department, I'm sure you'll probably agree, is that it's ne we're never we're never sort of treated as students. Like we're all, we are always we always have a seat at the table, so to speak. Like we people have respect for us and treat us as as equal. Um, so I think that's good because I think that would be quite difficult, and I'm sure it probably happens in other departments in the country where it's kind of like, oh well, you're you're just a PhD student, you know this and that. So I think in our department it's been really easy because you know there is quite a level playing field with that. Um, so I never really feel as a student, to be honest. Only I just feel more that we work in the department and we're doing our research the same as everyone else. Um, it's just that ours is a PhD, basically. Um, but I feel like you asked me another question that I've not asked, answered then. No, well, I mean, would, you, would, would you would you guide in that somewhere else? So. I was just sort of curious to ask. I mean, obviously, like I'm gonna be doing that myself, uh, but like just, oh, just yeah. for, you know, for uh, benefit of uh, again, because there's the idea of being a teacher and a student is that can blow a lot of people's minds. It's very as I yeah almost juxtaposed, but not quite. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think like yeah, like I say, I think it's I do feel more of a staff member than a student. Um, 
can't really remember what it was like to begin with, though. But like we have had different starting points, really, though, because obviously my first day was in the office, my second day was in the office, and third, and so forth. Like so, for the first few months, where it's like you pretty much done. What is it like eight months now, or something like that? Getting, Nine months now. Getting into it, yeah. Yeah, and and yet to be like have that you know sort of experience in the in the department. So yeah, it's a bit different, but. As I say, I think um, I think you'll I think you'll probably feel the same way. I think you'll think, well, I'm not really a student, not not compared to, well, to put it this way, when you're teaching the first year students, you'll know that you're not a student. <laughs> <laughs> I you'll, mean, if anything, yeah, it's just going to reinforce that I feel old. <laughs> no, honestly, I thought that because when I well, no, I'd have been, I'd have just turned twenty four. Um, and the 18-year-olds in front of me made me feel like a dinosaur, honestly. <laughs> um, I thought, oh, my God, like, they, they, are, they are 18. Like, they are definitely 18. Like, some of them come in and, they were, you know, some of them still thought it was school. Like, you know, they were really timid and quiet. And They're all there like, someone has to go to the toilet and stuff like that. It was, yeah, it was crazy. Like, so they were the TikToks and, thought, wow. and the Snapchats and asking to go to the toilet. Yeah. Oh, wait for snappers. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, you will feel old. You will realise then now I'm definitely a staff member. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Um, sorry, we did sort of swing back to work there. Going back out of work, so you like, um, you, so you've travelled a little bit. You mentioned at the top of the show you like um stuff like hiking, sports. What sports you're into? What do you play? What do you watch? Um, well, I used to, I used to play football. That was what I was mad about. Yeah, everyone in the country is the same. Um, I still watch that. Um. Avidly, like, I'm a City fan. I don't know if that. Um, I think I don't think you'll you'll be happy with that. Are you? Well, you're a well, for, fan. for the benefit of uh, international listeners, which city? <laughs> oh, Manchester City. <laughs> yeah, just, that's not me being obnoxious. Just you know, there are several um, football clubs that have City in the name. True. That is true. Um, yeah, if, if people can tell by the accent, but yeah, I am a Manchester City fan. Um, yeah, so I've been going since I was like since I could remember. And, um, fell in love even even before the takeover. This was um, so, oh a proper football fan. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I used to watch absolute dross every week, and then how old would I have been when the takeover happened? Probably twelve, something. Yeah, about twelve. Yeah, so that was quite quite nice. And the the ten years that has passed since has been more than nice. <laughs> <laughs> Paved with gold. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, um, so yeah, so I like, I, you know, I'll watch every every bit of football that's on telly, um, and I'll go to the city as much as I can. Like I used to have a season ticket for years, but um, I gave that up when I went to the Uni of Bath um, to do my masters. Um, obviously, it was just too too far. Like I couldn't come back, and I couldn't afford to pay that much. Um, continue paying that much as a student, and and, def- and not go. Um, so yeah, so I'm hoping hoping to get one sort of next season or one after, um, and then start going there more regularly. But yeah, I do go home there now. I have to ask because again, I know it's a, again a little bit of a dirty question uh, for PhD students, but have you found that like your research area has coloured your view of the hobbies, like of football at all? No, that's great questions. Great question. So it's one I get. Um, used to answering now is that yeah it's it's, 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 the, it's usually the question of um you, well you know you say a dirty question you you probably coated it really nicely compared to what most people um yeah usually i get asked like you know how can you be doing that and and still enjoy football how can you enjoy boxing how can you enjoy rugby um and my answer is always the same it's always i have perfect analogy now that i use um, and my research, I, I don't want to sort of rip up the rule book. I don't want to um, change any sports. Um, they're going to they're, they're going to ruin the sports that everyone loves them for. Um, my research is just to inform. And the analogy is that people eat fatty foods, they smoke, they drink alcohol. They know the risks of all those three things, but still, some people still engage in them. Some people don't because of what what they know the outcome may be. That's an informed decision. My research just wants to inform people so they can make the decision. Do they want to play with it? Do they want to box? Do they want to play football? 
former professionals now, sort of like Steve Thompson, he's a um, ex rugby player, he won the World Cup um, for England in 2003. He, he, he's um, got early onset dementia now. Um, doesn't remember winning the World Cup, doesn't remember the game. Um, and he says now that he wouldn't have played rugby, like he wouldn't have done it if he knew what what was happening. So, um, so that's my point: is that the research is there to inform, and if people make the informed decision and are aware of the risks, then that's that's fine by me. I don't want to sort of change any rules. I don't want to ban heading. Uh, I think I agree with um, limiting heading in training. I agree with um, banning heading sort of under twelves. Because that's that's kind of like a safeguarding issue, really, with, with children. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't sort of ban take, ban anything in rugby or in boxing and stuff like that. Um, but this is one of the things as well is that you see with rugby, you can see how it is well managed, and that the sport is remaining the same sport, but the provisions around it are really starting to increase and starting to get a lot better. Um, and that is something football, no matter how reluctant it is in pretty much everything, especially when it comes to player safety, um, needs to take note and needs to um, needs to follow suit. Really needs to emulate that because um, there's it's not going to change. Basically, it's not going to change. And um, the answer I don't think is to ban heading or to ban X, Y, and Z. Um, but I do think that the change needs to be. Um, well, protecting the players in other ways, the same way that rugby do and other sports do. Yeah, because I mean, it, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it only like last season, the season before, that concussion substitutes were a thing? Yeah, you know, but permanent ones, yeah. permanent concussion substitutes, which which can't work. Um, in rugby, the temporary concussion substitutes, um, which do work, and that's the whole point. So, for the listeners, the difference being that the temporary one. As the name suggests, you come off, you get assessed, someone takes your place. This other so team isn't disadvantaged. You're not in danger. If you're okay, really, and that player comes back off and you go back on. If you're not okay, then okay, that, that other player who's been put on for you stays on. That's brilliant. That's all it is. That's as simple as it is. But for football, it's a permanent one. And what a permanent one does is it's well, it's no different to a sort of normal substitute. Um the only thing is that you get two extra ones to your, to your regulated regulated three ones. So, um, as I say, in practice, a permanent concussion substitute. Um, coach on the sideline will be reluctant to bring you off for the test because if you're coming off, you will be off then. Um, so that that causes issues. Then should we should we bring him off? Is he going to be okay? So we're not really progressed anything that's just pretty much the same as if you'd had the normal substitute um, if you come off you're off then so someone else goes back on if you're then okay you can't go back on so what is the point of it it's not a, it's not a concussion substitute it's just a substitute and don't you if you're not have okay to then... not play again for five days in football yeah exactly exactly and so if you're okay and then you, you can't play for another five days afterwards so it, it's just it's not fit for purpose at the moment and I've um I've, I've I've sent emails to the FA with with no reply, and um, I am trying my best to try and get. I've written a piece on it as well. I don't know if you've read it uh, in Cycreds, and um, pretty much explaining that process and how I think um, how I think it, it can change for the better. Um, we'll uh, we'll make sure a link to that is in the description to wherever you found this. <laughs> Brilliant, that nice little nice little drop in there. Um, but no, yeah. So I think I think one of the things is. Football definitely needs to change it from permanent to temporary because, I mean, it, it was just ridiculous that it's, it was just, well, it was just a, a bit of a PR stunt, I would say, like in terms of introducing it because it doesn't it doesn't do anything, it doesn't add any safety to the players. It adds confusion more than anything. Um, and as I said, well, there's been cases already like George Baldock at Sheffield United played on... Um, Till half time and got brought off. I think they said Yob at West Ham was the same. And if you're bringing them off at half time when you've got time to assess them, they're not, they weren't okay, were they? They weren't okay 20 minutes ago when they back there. So, um, yeah, so I think one of them is definitely changing to temporary. And then another one, I think, is limiting the number of substitutes as well. 
And not that's not the number of substitutes you can make, but the number on the bench. So at the minute, it's seven, isn't it? So you have 11 in the starting 11, obviously, and then seven substitutes. And then of a squad of like 25, what's that been 18? So seven players aren't on the bench at all. They're just wherever, in the stands watching. There is no reason for that now. Like that, that needs to change because one of the things that I was thinking was that, I don't, and as I'm saying, I'm, I'm thinking proactively, and football in general is a very reactive sport, which is an issue. But, um, and I think this will become an issue in years to come, and then and then they'll react to it again. But we should just change it now. So, as I was going on, if you've got seven subs. Um, positions you choose for your substitutes may may not may not work out. So, for example, if um, if the goalkeeper goes off for whatever injury, and then you put your other goalkeeper on, and that goalkeeper gets a concussion, what what do you do then? What what happens then? Whereas most squads will have three goalkeepers. So, what I what I suggest is that. You should have the starting eleven, and then anyone in the squad should be a should be an available substitute. And then in that case, then it, you know tactically you're you're not at a disadvantage if it's the goalkeeper was just an example, but if it was like a right back, right mid, whatever, um, then you'd have the whole squad at your disposal to choose from, and then it would reduce the goal, you know coaches or um, assistant coaches or whatever um, saying like, oh, should we keep them on? Should we do this? Or well, we've not, you know. We've not got enough on the bench, or we're going to have to change shape. But if you've got your whole squad next year, then it's like, well, actually, yeah, we'll bring them off and we've got him to put back on. So I think I think that's another way that we could hopefully protect players a bit better. So to play to play um, advocate a little bit there, um, what was your view on the five substitutions rule? Because there was a big kick off at the time saying that well, it benefits bigger clubs more than. Your lesser, richer clubs—they've got more utility to bring on their better players. Um, or the, I mean, there were wasn't there a case or two last season where clubs like didn't even have enough players to fill the bench because of injuries and and COVID and things like that. Um, so how yeah. how do you think that would go down with the, the the Premier League teams, as it were? Yeah, with with um with five substitutes, obviously I understood their ideas with um with COVID and stuff and. Um, it was, it was more to do with tiredness, wasn't it? Because they, they had such a weird like off season and stuff, and coming back and and stuff like that. Um, I'm I'm not too too bothered about that. I'm, I'm not on about increasing the number of substitutes. I'm on about increasing the number of available substitutes. So mm-hmm. I think if it was up to me, I would probably keep it at three. I think three is enough. Um, but what the amount you have to choose from, I think, should increase to as many as you've got, because then. Like you say, you've got um, like any any team will be able to to to, to um, put on three players on the bench. Um, like you say, if the COVID issues and injuries and stuff, if sometimes people can sometimes teams can name like five or six out of the seven. Um, if you can name the whole squad, that would always be over three on the bench, wouldn't it? So I think um, keeping it at three, I would say, or going back to three. Um, that you can actually make, um, but on an unlimited temporary sub- concussion substitute. And what I will say actually is, is when you usually speak about this, people then tend to say, "Oh, well, well, you know, what if players then tactically try and abuse the rules?" And for that, to that, I just think, well, let them. Like, it, you know, players will abuse the rules no matter what. But the, well, I mean, the players anyway. are very intelligent. That's what I mean. So it's going to happen anyway. Um, so I think I think it's telling how many people are more concerned about the rules being broken than the welfare of the players. Yeah, I mean, um, I, you know, again, like I'm I'm quite the football fan myself. You know, I, I enjoy the football. I enjoy football video games as well, particularly in like that squad management kind of aspect. But just talking about the rules, I think a good one would be, and again, hot topic, but VAR, you know. And like I always yeah. I always like to reference, particularly with player safety in mind, the delaying of an offside flag. You know, and you always yeah. hear the commentators yeah. saying it like, 
how long is it going to be before the flag doesn't go up and a player gets a horrific injury and that could have been prevented yeah. because well we have to yeah. run it through the system like what are you what's your view on that and then we can talk about VAR more generally yeah i mean yeah well that actually is in um the piece that i wrote as well is that it was it's frustrating to see was i'm going on a little tangent but i will come back um it's frustrating to see how quickly and how concerned the game is with VAR, like with um well i mean how many handball rules did we have last season well this is what i mean yeah bring bringing it in changing all the laws of the game to suit it um changing it year on year since it's come in um, and ignoring ignoring other aspects of the game like player safety because they are just just the puppets that, that play the game essentially to in their eyes and um, so that's that's what does frustrate me so but yeah VAR I, I'm, I'm certainly not a fan of it I really don't like it um, I'm more I'm more of a fan of um, just keeping it as human as possible like I know it was frustrating with referees and offsides that weren't, and you know, goal goal line technology. Actually, I don't, I don't mind. I'd keep that. Um, so we failed once in like what was it, ten thousand times. So I would keep that. But um, VAR and stuff is, is, I think it is ruining the game. It's slowing it down. Like you say, you, for some reason, the, the linesmen are now told keep your flag down until the, you know, until they potentially score, because then we can check it. But as you say, you're keeping the flag down, and then they could potentially break the leg, or could, you know, anything could happen. Um, where a lot of the time, you just put your flag up, on it and then we can check the, the offside instead, can't we? Um, but yeah, for me, I, I would I, could, I would keep the AR if, if we just didn't obsess about it too much. And I'm I'm concerned that it's more um, TV have, might have a bigger influence than what people might think in terms of. Um, making it a better spectacle for the watcher at home but I'll tell you now it's not a good spectacle when you're in the ground and you just stood there thinking what, what's going on and when you can't celebrate goals the same as anymore because you're checking every tiny little detail um, so yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sold on very hard to be fair I hear one of the, the common league. sort of criticisms is that they should adopt a system similar to rugby where you know, you you get to hear the refs talking about the check. You can you understand the mm. thought process. They're talking to the players, um, and like it is that kind of you let play happen, then you review it, um, and then like if a decision wrong, they rectify it. It's much. Um, they've got the yeah. rules much more ironed out. I'm, I'm not a huge rugby fan myself, so I don't know definitively. No, no, they're they're, they're good, and like I said, they're definitely on it more with concussion as well. But um, I was going to say as well is tennis could be a good. Um, a good sort of system that they're using the three challenge system you, you know maybe if a, if a manager wanted to challenge a decision if you get it right you keep your three if you get it wrong you don't think you're down to two and you you know both teams get three challenges if there was a close offside is it worth the referee you know the coach saying like oh, we'll go to VAR now and then VAR looks at it you know as I say if it was right you keep this challenge and then yeah so it could be anything for you don't know like uh, it probably won't work with like red cards and stuff with it, but um, anything that's like, I suppose that with, with with dangerous play, you would keep that to the ref and go the ref go into the monitor and stuff. I think for offside, you could potentially bring in the challenge system. I think would be quite good. They also it use that in, quite well. in cricket, don't they? I believe you get like challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so because I think another yeah, I think another one is like you know again like yeah, I'm a Liverpool fan and we we I've seen scenes of. An armpit being offside, so a goal not being given, and the whole like yeah. you don't really gain an advantage from my armpit being offside. And I remember one, uh, Patrick Bamford was yo know, played, yeah. went on, scored, but it was not given because he had his arm out telling his opponent, like his teammate, where he wanted the ball. Which if yeah. if you've played football ever, you understand it's a completely natural part of the game. Because yeah. I mean, pointing is like you can do more with that. Because if you shout, you're also telling all your opponents what you want doing as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's funny you mentioned that because that is exactly the uh, example I was going to use. Because if you actually watch it back, he's curving his run as well. So he's run, he's running back towards his own goal to get on side to then so, so to curve his run basically, and then he's put his arm out to to say where he's going. So when the ball's played, he's running back 
but because the in, in, on you know in the freeze frame, there's that tiny little bit of his sleeve probably is 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 offside. But my argument is that he's not even he's not gaining an advantage. He's running back towards the, his own player who's got the ball, curving his run to then go forward. So it's not even one of them where so those ones are really annoying because obviously if you're running and you've got the momentum and you're running forwards, then you are gaining an advantage. But if you're running backwards and then you're offside, <laughs> you're not gaining any advantage because if you carry on the video like that, you know, then you could receive the ball five yards in front of the defender behind you. And they say, oh, well, you're offside. Well, you've not gained anything, so just play on. And I think that is, it's important to keep the game sort of fluid, isn't it? But I'm worried that VAR is doing the exact opposite. <laughs> You, you touched on it yourself with the, the whole making it a spectacle, like the lines. Mm. I feel like we've got to talk about the lines, how how mm. the lines do just seem drawn on differently every single time by every different person. Well, yeah, I think there was um, there was one, obviously, oh, well, <laughs> we won't get into an argument, but there was one uh, where City or Anfield, one of, one of the drummings that you give us every year, um, and I, I'm sure the lines weren't, weren't even straight. Like if you looked on the, if you compare it to the lines, you know, from the groundsman on the pitch, the VAR one didn't even look straight. I was thinking that's, you know, is is you you literally building a case for, um, for basically everyone saying that they're drawn on because, yeah, they just look different every week. They they really do. Like and like it's like they're always at a, a janky angle, and it's just like just the the pitch and. I suppose it maybe goes, and we're just talking football meta now. I apologise, listeners, if you're not football fans. Um, but like, <laughs> pitches can be different sizes within a certain yeah. parameters, right? So you couldn't even just say, "Well, all pitches are broken up into these grids," because that wouldn't work because pitches are different sizes to within certain degrees, mm-hmm. right? But I mean, why why do we not just have a like a grid map of the pitch and be like, okay? So we would know where the lines would be. Even something as simple as that would clear up all that level of confusion yeah i don't know i honestly i would just um for me i wouldn't even use it i would use it but not not the lines not the lines at all i would use var for offsides you know just completely blatant ones like do you remember sterling for liverpool against city do you remember that time where you scored against us it was about five yards off the onside mm-hmm. stuff like that like i would use var for that where you quickly go to yeah, he goes to the monitor, goes, right, yeah. That's a clear and obvious error, which is what they keep telling us. Um, and then using it for completely, the complete opposite, the errors that aren't clear and obvious. And then I would just keep the ones that are like fingernails and, um, you know, like a tiny bit of the shoulder. Armpits. And just give Come the on. advantage to the striker. Like, yeah, just give... We want the game to have goals. Give the give the benefit to the striker. Carry on. And if... if you know the the referee, the VAR ref, spots something and says, "Oh no, that's completely wrong." Like that is, you know, you need a quick look at this. Then we can change that one. And I think that's where technology and sport or VAR, whatever uh, you want to call it, could be the for, to the benefit of the game. But yeah, the 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 uh, making it a spectacle, as I said, with the lines and stuff, really, really frustrates me. Uh, and it again, frustrates to, me more being in the ground at the time. To to bring that back as well, you know. Um... It's important for like that element of like player safety and stuff. It really is. Like mm. it's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, because how long will it be before something happens? Well, it will happen. Yeah, it will happen. Yeah. Um, I remember there was there was a point where there was an absolutely ridiculous. I can't remember what country it was in now, but there's a ridiculous. Um, this is going away from player safety, but I'll come back to it. But um, it where like there was something like. Well, it's not his kind of player safety, but I think there was there was a challenge in the box, um, one end, and then it wasn't given as a penalty, but the player stayed down, and then that team went up and scored. And in the end, they had to chalk that goal off and give the penalty to the other team. So it's an absolute joke because, like like we said, instead of um, I know this wasn't the lines when it wasn't offside, but instead of um, the referee like the referee hadn't seen something, but um, in any other, without VAR, that would have just been a goal to the other team. But because we've got VAR and because we would, would analyse and everything so quickly now and so like in detail, it makes a bit of a mockery of it. Because it's like, oh, well, we're taking that goal off you now and then 
given that these are penalty and I'm sending you off because it was dangerous play and it's, oh, it's an absolute mess. <laughs> well, like that um, needs to be happening before, doesn't it? Like, it, you know, don't yeah, let exactly. it go that far. Yeah, yeah. You can't go up the other end and um and, and score a goal and then and then chalk it off surely. But um yeah, I think it is a matter of time, like you say, when the linesmen keep the flag down because they've been instructed to, and then someone just gets like seriously hurt. But then it's it's even more a bitter pill to swallow when when it was avoidable. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think it just is we we yeah, we we spoke about football for like a while here, but and it wasn't intentional. <laughs> But it just it you we relate all this back to because like this is important, like and you know I know the the thinking of shifting rules like um like stopping the clock when the ball goes out of play and things like that. It's like okay, you can see why they're trying to do that, but that again just feels more like show pieces and it's like a, oh we want the game to be this way, but then we're instantly gonna put things in that go against that. Like oh we want the game to flow, but we can also like stop it after you've scored. And decide it's not a goal for reasons. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, the, like I say, the clear and obvious error. That's the thing we keep going on about when, and then they'll use it for everything that isn't clear and obvious. Um, another another contradiction is the same thing: is the clear and obvious error, and then the referee will look at something for about five minutes. It's not clear and obvious if you have to look at it for five minutes. Um, but yeah, and then um, as as you just say, like what was it you just said? I've forgotten now. <laughs> well, just like you know, they'll, they'll but they'll want to they'll really start talking about moves like, uh, oh, we'll start stopping the clock when the ball goes out. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we want the game to flow, was the other one. Um, so we want the game to flow, but we, and then they do the exact opposite and, and stop everything that you can at you know, at each given moment. So, yeah, frustrating is, is bad, and frustrating is the, the amount of effort and resources put into it when other areas areas of the game get neglected okay um so to just sort of take a little bit of a shift what sort of what sort of other stuff do you get up to you know we, we obviously big sport fan it bleeds into your work a little bit uh what what else what do you do when your your mind is not thinking about sport um let me think what do i think what do I do? um i've tried to read as best i can um because obviously with the job that we're in um, we're reading quite a lot on a monitor, um, so I think quite, and obviously it's quite you're quite concentrated with that. So I, I do try to uh, read as best I can, like an actual physical book. Um, so yeah, I try, I try to do that as pretty much once a day or so. I think yeah, reading for pleasure is a a, a more unique challenge when you you're having to read for academic purposes. Um, yeah, exactly. Have you read anything good lately? Yeah, um, I do find um, that it does. It, it does kind of. It, don't know what's the word. Um, it does bring me down a bit, though. To be fair, like it does, like because you, you're actually using your imagination a bit, and you um, you think about something else. Um, yeah, I read the Tatuist of Auschwitz recently. Um, I think that was an excellent book. I don't know if you've read that. I um, personally. But you can imagine what it's about. In uh, fact, given the title. Um, so yeah, so it's semi autobiographical. Well, it's biographical. So it's someone else who wrote it about him. But um, yeah, just telling the the story of um, tattoo buyer, um, tattooist um, at Auschwitz, and um, basically how he um, how he had to do what he could, he could to survive, essentially. And what he was doing was tattooing um, his own his own people, basically. Um, and he had to put the numbers on 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 each on each person's arm, um, and as 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 I say, it's, if that's not the whole story. It goes on to um, other bits um, and things, and yeah, basically, yeah, what he, what he did to um, get through living there. I've read that and I was like less like I don't know like soul destroying. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, to be honest, I'm I'm quite interested in the war, so I do I do read quite a bit on that. Um, so no, the sequel actually, Silk's Journey is what I'm reading at the moment. I mean, <laughs> so I, would, that that probably... I will like put my hands up. So I read a lot of sci-fi dystopia, which is like the end of the world kind of stuff. So I, I you know I asked yeah. that question tongue in cheek. I mean, I was reading yeah, um, yeah. The Stand by Stephen King during 2020, which is about 
Oh, right. A plague well, that wipes yeah. out humanity. So, you know, like, yeah. lol. Oh, some blood still, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I think, um, yeah, what I was going to say was uh, Silver was basically one of the people that was in Auschwitz with the, tat- the tattooist of Auschwitz. Um, so that's the second book that she's done based on, on her life as well. That one wasn't in Auschwitz. It's basically after Auschwitz, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's any lighter than, than the first one. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I, I should probably write, get like a quite easy going book next. I've, I read um, 1984 last year as well. That's a that's a classic, pretty heavy, pretty heavy going as well. Yeah, so what, what did you think? think of, what did you think of uh, 1984? I thought, I thought I really liked it, mate. Um, yeah, I think I would, I wouldn't mind reading Animal Farm as well, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I think I, I really enjoyed it. Um, definitely made me think. Um, and I was never aware that Big Brother, the television program, was was based on that. Um, but no, it was good. What What did you think of it? I I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll try and do it spoiler free. But like, I remember yeah. physically getting chills when like there was the twist. Um, mm. like in towards the third act, I remember being like, "Whoa, like that!" And like, that's a really impressive feeling to get from you know like from a book that it, it takes very well crafted writing to do that in a non sort of you know uh particularly in a non like horror genre you know where you kind of maybe geared yeah. up for that more um but it's it, yeah. it's so interesting to you know i read it a couple of years ago and to see just how impactful it still is today and how meaningful it isn't yeah. you know it's quite shocking <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm I'm yeah, reading. I'm not... Oh, sorry. No, no. I was, I was just gonna say I'm not 100 percent sure on when it was written. Probably getting up to about 90 years ago, 80 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I'm reading rereading um June by Frank Herbert, which was like 75. Um, I think, right. and like so much of the commentary around like uh fossil fuels and resources and race and sexism. Is like still apparent, and it's, it's kind of terrifying. How like did did have we learned nothing from these artists, from these well, authors? This is this yeah, this is it, isn't it? It's, those are the ones that stand the test of time, isn't it? When, um, when they're speaking about humanity, and and nothing changes. I suppose Lord of the Flies is pretty similar as well. Um, yes. If you read that, and it's it's like yeah, <laughs> it's one thing to, um, sort of. What's, what's the word? It's one thing to write about how society is and predict how it could become, and then it's another thing for it, as I say, stand the test of time and for things perhaps not to change or perhaps the predictions to go seemingly true. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it's really interesting, and as you say, one of my favourite, I think the thing I loved most about 1984 was really simple, but it was uh, like the Ministry of Love, I think, like Love and Relationships, but it's like yeah. Oh, all that is is just that's just pure spying. We just call it the Ministry of Love because it sounds better. Um, yeah, yeah. And again, like you know, yeah. spoiler free, but like the ending, because I, 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 you know, I can freely admit I hate like all stories have to have a happy ending, like the good, you know, the good, the good quote unquote, because that's a philosophical term, and your know, perspective is important in good and evil quote unquote. Um, mm. but like you know, oh, the the good side always have to win and things have to be great, and I was like, no, like. Yeah. Like if you've experienced it's not realistic, isn't it? if you've experienced real life, that's not always the way things roll out. No, no, no. And that I think I think um I think oh, I don't know actually Just careful what I have to say. No, I was gonna say I think children's books should probably not 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 end in like, you know, tragedy, but perhaps perhaps we shouldn't be gearing them for success all the time and gearing them for a happy ending all the time. I don't know. It's, got, it's definitely the way with children's books, isn't it, in terms of all the good guys win and the bad guys lose. Well, there's um, a big um, that, criticism it's... of, like, fairy tales in general, how, like, the sort of modern kind of, I'm going to say, Disney-influenced, in, in, in uh, influenced, I guess, impacted, yeah. like, are all geared like that when the original kind of stories are much mm-hmm. more, you know, they're a, they're a warning <laughs> more than anything. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, they're... Yeah, the Disney, um, yeah, Walt Disney was not, uh, was, it's nothing like what it is now, is it? This wasn't his idea for, for Disney, really, was it? 
no i mean yeah uh, sorry the phrase i was looking for was a cautionary tale like a lot of the original fairy tales are yeah yeah like th- this is why you don't wander off into the woods and meet strange women yeah more <laughs> of a fable yeah essentially um, yeah it's got a, got a deeper meaning of, of, of a lesson a life lesson I think we may be going like too metaphilosophical here and I apologize for that. <laughs> but like, I think one of the trends I found with stuff that I've read that has been released more recently, um, you know, is like, it kind of bonks you over the head with its like message, right? Like, so like, aggr- again, pardon the concussion point, I apologize. Um, but it really tries hard to be very explicit in like, a, this is the point I'm trying to make. And I think compared to, maybe it's unfair, you can completely call me out for that. But, like, the thing that makes a thing art, in my opinion, is that it allows you to interpret it. Like, the artist may have a vision, but they give you it, and then you walk away and you interpret it the way you want. And 1984 is a good example of that, how there are multiple interpretations. And I think think the reason that everyone always says, oh, the book, the book's better. The book's better than the film for for pretty much everything. Um, I'm yet to, to hear anyone say the film's better than the book. I think that's the reason, isn't it? I think more well, books it is up to you to interpret. Even even for something like you say is is quite evident what the message is and what the, you're still interpreting like what this character looks like or sounds like or you know the emotions they're feeling. Um, and I think that's the difference, isn't it? When you when you watch a film, it's kind of someone else's interpretation they're forcing on you, but they they've read the book, they interpreted it, and this is what they've come up with and they're showing it. Obviously, the, the benefits of film is, is it's all quicker and all this lot, and, you know. But um, yeah, I think I think that is it's the same point, isn't it? That's why people enjoy books. But we may be going too far the other way, even with film, and that um, everything has to be so explicit and so um, forced at you, rather than being a bit more subtle and, and giving you allowing you yeah that that extra interpretation. I mean, I will. I actually have an example of a time when um, the film was bad. Well, no, actually, no, no, I'm wrong. It was no, no. I was, I was going to be like a. I was going to say a film where like they wrote a book afterwards and the book was dross, but. <laughs> oh right, what, which one was it? What, I'm, was I'm sure they like did something like that with like Star Wars, where like they then like you know to monetize it, they just produced um, books. They wrote books <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too sure on that. But they're maybe not like full oh, yeah. like novels. It's, probably, it's not really a one to one comparison, is it? I'll be fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, nearly, nearly a good one though. Nearly a good. Um, maybe, so. maybe one day it'll happen. Someone will turn a. I think. Okay, so again, slight tangent, but um, I feel like you see it more interesting with with TV shows. So you know, um, Game of Thrones, for example. Um, I'm 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 ha- I'm just just about started that so no spoilers on <laughs> no, that for me please no spoilers, um <laughs> yo the, yeah I feel like I'm just naming brands like you know Netflix are famous for you know they do a season that's based on a book and then they want more so they produce more and you know things like that but like with Game of Thrones it was very evident where they started to go off the material that wasn't like not exactly one to one but taken directly from the book you could notice a mm-hmm. a distinct change in my opinion in quality that's my opinion. Had you had you read the books before yet? Yes, yeah, I read the book yeah. up to like the point they are at at, at the time of recording. Um, again, like um, you see, so um, for context, another good example is Netflix. Is it you? Um, it's based on a series of yeah, books. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I forget the author name. I'm reading the third one at the minute. Caroline something. I apologize. I will add it to the show notes. Um, but like I, I'm now reading the third one, and it's after. There were significant changes made to the show uh, in the second season compared to the book. And reading it, you can tell where that's had its influence. And you kind of got this almost symbiotic nature of the fact that the show is different to the second book. Second season is different to the second book. And how the influence of the show has impacted the third book. So how's that going to affect the TV show? And it's like a you, you can really it's feel it's the influence. Uh, writing, you think? I, I, I think it has, yeah. Again, personal opinion. Strange, isn't it, really? Because, um, yeah, like, I, having started watching Game of Thrones, like, I'm midway through season three now. And um, just the just the depth of it, I think, is, like, I just think, well, these books are going to be incredible, like, surely, like, you know, because the, the depth of it, but it's still 
at times quite shallow at the same time. So it's, there's so much going on. Um, and I just think, well, you know, in a book, you can really explore these characters and, um, and all these different things that are going on. Um, so immediately when I started watching it, I just thought yeah, these these books will be really, really good. Um, but yeah, so it, it'll be interesting to see if his pan out that same way. If, if you know, the, the, the success of the season, of the, of the series has had like uh, an impact on these books that he's continuing to, to write. I, I and again, spoiler free. Oh, I have a question about that in a second. Um, but I, I honestly think because of fan reaction to the show, I would not be surprised if George R. R. Martin changed it and was just like, "This changed was the it, end yeah, all yeah. along." Well, I, yeah. I, I mean, I was having this conversation as well with my brother the other day. But I thought, I surely he'll change it anyway, just because, just for monetary purposes. Like when, when nobody knows the end again, the second time round. And as you say, it almost feels ridiculous for him to to go along with an ending that that people were unhappy with. To you know, the self fulfilling prophecy of disappointment. It's just mm. I can't imagine him doing that to be honest. And then I can. And then once the new book is out, they'll make another series on what on the the righted ending. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Maybe. you can see it happening. So I have to kind of ask you know you so you rewatch you're watching it for the first time. Uh, yeah. How how have you managed? Have you avoided spoilers? Like, do you have no idea what happened? Um, yeah. Um, so, if so, my question is: no, How did you avoid thing, the spoilers? <laughs> the only no. Do you know what? I did really well because um, I I used to be honest. People, whenever people spoke about it around me, I just and you can appreciate this with the the, the names. Like, I'll have heard names in the past that I know now, but I never knew them then. So the very obscure names that I would just never have popped onto or never, you know, thought of, um, with the exception of a few, obviously. But um, And even even because of the context of it, like, even if they'd said something, I, would never, I wouldn't have understood it or remembered it anyway. And then I think because of my interest in it wasn't there, people never really said anything to me or anything, but... Um, I am having to keep it a secret now that I am watching it because I know people will attempt to spoil it for me just because everyone's seen it. Uh, but the only thing that has annoyed me now, actually, is when I was watching Gogglebox about a year ago and it was on that. There's a bit of it on that, a bit of the last episode. Um, and I will tell you, it's basically uh, Daenerys riding a dragon and that is pretty much all I know. But it's a spoiler enough that I know she gets to the end, essentially. I mean, in in a in a, in a show and a story where people like drop like flies, that is still quite spoilery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't, I can't change that now. But as far as they go, um, I'm pretty happy that I don't know anything else. As I say, that is that's an impressive feat, to be honest. To having yeah, to have gone through. I think the thing with spoilers though is, is usually it's around the time of when they come out, isn't it? Like, and then it'll all just die down. Like people aren't just like tweeting now about Game of Thrones saying like this happens and the other. So like when it because uh, I and oh, I don't know how I do it because I did it with Lion of Jimmy recently as well. I watched that. I I have not. And it's it's like on the very you know, very long wish list of things to watch. Yeah, brilliant. You should watch it. I, I regretted that I didn't watch it as it came out. Um, but yeah, again, uh, I was. When this like this sixth season came out, I thought I'll just I'll just watch him and yeah, it was brilliant. But during that, so I started watching it like from the beginning when this last season started. So every Sunday night, I just avoid Twitter because I knew everyone would <laughs> just go on about it. So um, yeah, I think maybe that's my, my technique. I used to just avoid Twitter when when something's on. You heard it here first, peeps. If you you want to avoid spoilers, yeah. just avoid the internet. There you go. Get off the internet, uh, just read a book. <laughs> <laughs> read a book. Fair enough. Um, okay, so just to sort of go back to the sort of questions a little bit. Um, we've spoken a little bit about what you want to do next with your work. Um, this is one of my favourite questions to ask. What would be your blue sky project? So there are no limitations. You have infinite resources, time. P- you know, a p- team of people that are expert in every single thing you need doing. What would that project look like? Wow, um, that's quite a hard one to answer. That 
I know that it would it would definitely still be on what I'm doing now. Like it would definitely still be something to do with concussion. Um it would definitely have to be more with more with sort of the older generation now than I guess maybe. Maybe working with um you, you keep seeing now with like sort of those that are in the 70s and 80s that used to play football that are getting dementia now. Um, I guess that I'd love to do a project with like sort of those those people. Um, whether that was like qualitative or quantitative. Um, and as well, working working with the families of them as well, I think, is understated. Is you know, they are they are people in the end, like they are, and then um, they are leaving people behind. Um, so Dawn Astle, like daughter of Jeff Astle, who died um nearly 20 years ago now. Um and she's campaigned ever since and stuff. So um I think yeah, working with, with, with the families of them would be quite a good project. And as well as obviously the older generation as well, because it is a bit of a harder demographic to, to get hold of. Um and you know, you you know what it's like you, you usually the vast majority of research is, is university students, isn't it? Um just because of the ease of obtaining them, but yeah, I think it would be quite beneficial if we were to get hold of this older generation now that where there seems to be a link with dementia and heading the ball. If we were then able to better understand what what you know any every generation below them might be looking at, might be looking towards in the future. Fair enough. And I think again, you know, for, for listeners' benefit, that is the kind of project that is that's a blue sky idea because that would be really difficult to do. In terms of time and resource, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, um, yeah. I think um, I think the want for the players would probably be there, but um, again, yeah, I think the capacity for different players would be different, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Depending on if they had dementia or not. Uh, and I think level. so. I've got I've got another question, and this is one that I like. I admittedly came up with uh, very recently, so it wasn't on the sheet. I sent you. I apologize. But have you got? You know, I like to, you know, this is about me speaking to people and, and you know, people's real stories, if you will. Um, so apologies if this is a very left field question. But like, have you got anyone or anything that particularly inspires you to do the work you do? Like, you know, is there anyone like maybe who's like work you really like look up to and you go, yeah, they're doing what I want to be doing. Or even just like, you know, it can be like a, an important figure in your life. You're just like, yeah, like these these people help inspire me, carry on. Doing what I'm doing. Like, you don't That's have to be like, question. oh, I love, I love like this author, or like you know, you could just be like me mum because she's class, you know, like that's. But like, is there is there anyone that yeah. maybe gives you that inspiration? Maybe. I think. Um, I was having that. I was having a similar conversation actually with um, with someone in the sport department who's also a GTA. And um, we both sort of agreed on the, on the same answer in terms of it's important to have this kind of inspiration. Um, and I, 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 I'll veer off slightly, not not to... Well, I'll answer it, Charlie. So <laughs> basically, it's, um, it's all about having inspiration from different areas because inspiration or motivation can come and go depending on various things, and especially over a long period. So people, um, as I say, people might be there and they might they might not at different times, whether that is like, you know, you have got your parents that are predominantly there, you know, for large periods. Well, things like relationships can change, whether that's romantic or platonic, like, um, and then, so, so to get to the answer, I think one of the things that is really important is to do it for yourself, is to, to inspire yourself, essentially. Um, because if you don't, if you're not doing it for you, if you're doing it for other people, then in the end, I think it would be really difficult for you to continue or for it to be sustainable, essentially. So I think, um, I think, I was really trying not to make it a selfish answer, but I think I inspire myself to be better all the time, basically. 
I want to be better than I was yesterday and then just carry on and on and on. But obviously, it goes without saying, like, the, you know, family and friend um, is, is hugely important. Like, you, you've got to have that as well. Um, but, yeah, to veer off again, what I was getting at was that it's not always people. So um, sometimes your motivations can come from other things, but it can't just be one sole thing because if that then disappears... Um, then what have you got? Like, what what motivates you? And I think that would be <laughs> probably from a from a third year student, PhD student to a first year one. That would be a piece of advice in terms of maybe maybe recognizing what it is that that inspires you, because then you'd probably be better equipped to know if something's or changes or if something drops. It's okay. Oh well, it's all right. That's all right. That's happening in the background, but I've still got all these reasons to be doing what I'm doing. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, that was a very candid and very nuanced answer, uh, considering I <laughs> I put the, this question out like a couple of days before production. Um, Thank you. So really, I mean, that's, you know, you heard it here first, like in, in, be your own inspiration. Like, obviously other things are important, but if, if you're not inspiring yourself to push yourself forward and take through what you're doing, like, that's a big, it's a big barrier to entry. Well, actually, I think... Um... Yeah, I think of all full dis full disclaimer. I think I've definitely been inspired by. Um, I don't know if you'll have ever seen it. Um, Matthew McConaughey, his speech at the Oscars. I think it was. Have you seen it? Have you seen the? I, I can't. Like, I don't, I don't no. know it off like top of my head. Off the yeah, offhand. Well, I saw it once, and I think that's what's resonated with me since. Um, and it's pretty much a similar idea. Um, so any of the listeners want to watch it or probably tag it in on YouTube as well. Um, you and for yourself, you can watch it after this, but um, he was basically, someone asked him like, well, who's, um, who's your hero? Basically, that was it. Who's your hero? Um, and he said, um, well, it's, it's me. It's me in 10 years. Um, and then like 10 years later, you know, someone came back to him and said, who's your hero? Are you, are you your hero? Now? He says, well, no, I'm not. I'm not even close. Like, and then, like ten years ago, and so, are you a hero? I was like, no. And basically, he was saying like he's never gonna, he's never gonna get there. He's never gonna attain it. But it always gives him something to, to chase. Always something to keep him motivated. And then he obviously said like other different things. So like his his family and stuff. But it was always about that being better than he was, you know, in the past. And always looking to be, I'm I'm my hero. It's myself. I'm the one who motivates myself. But I probably will ever attain that, and I, that's good because it'll keep me going and going and going, you know, forever. Well, I mean, you know, that is uh, an excellent answer. <laughs> it's an excellent answer, and you know, it'd be interesting for listeners to compare that with uh, our other guests' answers. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll have to listen back and see what other people say. <laughs> um, so let's let's get into a little bit of fun then. Uh, we like to sort of get into it. Bit of a laugh before before we finish. We've had because I feel like we've kind of gone, you know, some very serious matter that's quite troubling, you know, a little bit of sport, and then we've sort of come back around to like, oh, you know, we're, we're on like a little bit of a crest of a wave here. So <laughs> yeah. let's just end to with our quick fire questions. So you are taking a, a sabbatical, a retreat. Uh, you're not you're not being sent away. You're choosing to go away to a little resort for a little while. Uh, the only problem is you're going very quickly, so you can only grab one of the following items each. So you're allowed to take one. Uh, it, originally it was one film, but I've been quite lean out of let people say one one DVD set. One, you know, All right, okay. So your TV shows are included, um, an album, a book, and then like a, a video game or other entertainment item, as you might find applicable. What do you take? Is it is it one of each? It's one or of just each. one out of all of those. One of each. Okay. One of each. Um. So I think I think the film would be Inception. I love that film. Um. And as you can tell, I'm quite a thinker. Um, if you've not gathered that over the last hour or so, someone someone studying um, a PhD, a thinker, color me impressed. Yeah, on <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, so yeah, I think I think Inception's brilliant. So I, I think I find something else out like I've never thought of each time I watch that. Um, as a true Mancunian, I'd say, what's the story, Morning Glory by Oasis? Um, I think that's you know can't go wrong with that superb album. Um, book just because I enjoyed it so much I think the tattooist of Auschwitz um, this is going to be quite a, 
quite a dreary um, recruit, retreat, isn't it? For me? Um, and then was it what was it? What was the other one? Uh, well, it's previously been done as a video game, but if you're not like a, a video game, it's just like something else that you do to entertain yourself. Okay. Um, well, we'll start as a video game, I think. Um, and I, I fell out of video games, really, to be honest. But um, the one the one game that just got me hooked, like when I just, I just wanted, the only one that I spent hours and hours, days on was uh, Fallout 3. And that was just Oof. superb. Oof, Brilliant that game. A, <laughs> that's a good shout. That's a good shout. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, do you have any questions for me before we wrap up? Um, yeah, okay, well, yeah. Why, where do you see yourself two years from now? So it's in my position, starting your third year. Oh, I mean, stressed. <laughs> <laughs> is that a... Is that a... I, hope, I hope not. Uh, honest, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've got my Gantt chart, and if I stick to it, nearly done, you know? Uh, yeah. Whether yeah. that happens or not, oh, who knows? Uh, but, you know, hopefully, like, you know, I'm a... I'm Just a, make a new one like everyone else does. <laughs> well, you know, I am I always describe myself, uh, particularly on this show, as someone who wants their cake and wants to eat it too. So I want to be, you know, on the back of conferences, having presented about, like, my first study that I've that I've done you know, sort of first, like, data collection and stuff, and I want to be, like, wrestling yeah. to try and get papers out and disseminate that information to anyone and everyone and uh, getting ready to write up the whole thing and, and get myself that those nice three letters at the end of my name to m- match the rest of them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, from what I've seen, I, I don't see why not. I think, you're, um, I think you're doing really well at the minute. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, for the benefit of listeners, uh, obviously the information will be attached below, but where, where are people best to find you? Uh, online of it so if we've got your twitter up there but where else would be good yeah um there's on twitter i'm not re- i'm not massively on um other different platforms um but my email address um do you want me to recite it or do you want to just attach it i can attach it, it as long as long as people know yeah. sort of where it is yeah twitter or uh or my uni email address is, is the, are the two best places to find me awesome stuff right well um Thank you, Danny, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I hope you had a good time. Uh, all that remains for us now is to say goodbye to our listeners. So I hope you've enjoyed um, this episode of Psych to be with you. Uh, I'm enjoying this as an entire experience. This has been a chat that's been a little bit different to all the others. The most sporty, which I quite quite like. I'll talk about football any day <laughs> of the week. Um, so Absolutely. we'll move over to the ending screen for the video edit. Uh, So thanks very much for watching, everyone, and uh, we will see you again very, very soon.